Good morning, friends. On behalf of USA India Business Summit and Global USA Business Forum and Georgia Tech Global Business Forum, I welcome you to our annual program, which is uh, being held today and tomorrow, November 17th and 18th, virtually. We have a jam-packed program for two days, 16 sessions, about 50 speakers. We are thankful to our partners and supporters, which you see here, our Georgia Tech Cyber Center for Business Education and Research, Global USA Business Forum, UIBS, Georgia Department of Economic Development, Novellis, Aditya Birla Group, and Equinix, as well as our sponsoring and supporting partners are Southern Company, Georgia Pacific, USIBRC, Forward Foresight, USC Aiken, Gokre Law Firm, Turkish Airlines, uh, Consulates of India and Canada, Metro Tanda Chamber, Connex, Next Generation Manufacturing, GMSTC, Met Marshall Automation, and Manchester Trade. We have media partners as Global Atlanta, Cover, Atlanta Dunia, NRI, Wow Now, Voice of Indus. We have been doing uh, this program for the last 12 years as UIBS and Georgia Tech Global Business Forum. And this is the first time we are launching Global USA Business Forum. You will see and hear more uh, from about our programming in the coming months and uh, next year about uh, the future programs. Uh, we have been working with Georgia Tech Cyber for the last 12 years, and I have my co-chair, Dr. John McIntyre, who is a program co-chair for Georgia Tech Global Business Forum, professor of management and international affairs of Scheller College of Business, Georgia Tech, and executive director, Georgia Tech Center for International Business Education and Research, Georgia Tech Cyber. Dr. McIntyre, welcome. Thank you, Annie Agniotri. It's a pleasure to be here on this bright and sunny day in Georgia in November, and uh, I'm delighted to be representing Georgia Tech and the Georgia Tech Cyber Center, which is a national center of excellence to introduce a collaborative venture. This is the 27th occasion, annual occasion for Georgia Tech to launch a global business forum in partnership with the 12th US India Business Summit and the first global USA Business Forum. We're very happy to participate and collaborate in this, uh, in, in this excellent program, a timely program. As you will see, it's a very uh, solid two days of excellent speakers on uh, state-of-the-art topics. We very much look, look forward to, uh, to listening and to participating and uh, welcome. Uh, and we'll be with you for the rest of the, for the next two days. Again, thank you. And uh, I'll turn it over back to uh, Ani so that we can uh, kick off the inaugural session. Thank you, Dr. McIntyre. I really appreciate your partnership, support, and guidance all these years. Uh, with this, uh, it's my distinct honor now to invite Dr. Bernard Kiplin. He's Vice Provost for International Initiatives and Stephen A. Denning, Chair for Global Engagement and Co-President of the Lafayette Institute, Metz, Georgia Tech. Dr. Kiplin. I'd like to, to really express my sincere gratitude to the two co-chairs of today's event, uh, namely Mr. Annie uh, Agnihotri, managing partner at uh, UIBS, and uh, my dear colleague and good friend, John McIntyre from the Scheller College of Business and director of the Center for International Business Education and Research or, or Cyber. So special thanks to all of the speakers and the uh, session moderators. We live in a world in flux. We have entered what uh, some refer to as the fourth industrial revolution, which is based on the convergence of the physical, the digital and biological worlds. And so new buzzwords have emerged such as artificial intelligence, internet of things, cybersecurity, blockchain, uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing, quantum computing, and, and, and others, just to, to name a, a few, and uh, many of which will be discussed during this event. Our economies are increasingly global, hyper-connected and uh, competitive, and digital technologies are changing businesses and societies at a pace that is unprecedented in uh, human history. All of this was true back in 2019, prior to the pandemic, and what we've all witnessed the, during the past year 
is that uh, major disruptions such as pandemics are in fact accelerators for change and innovation. It is clear that the challenges associated with our global digital economy reinforce the need for global research cooperation between the public and private sectors and that the training of globally minded students plays a crucial role. At Georgia Tech, we are committed to developing leaders who advance technology and the human condition. We believe that the Georgia Tech graduate will be creative, ethical, a technologically sophisticated innovator and entrepreneur, and that he or she will be globally minded. Connecting globally, being a convener of worldwide collaboration are part of the core goals of our new strategic plan. In 2020, Georgia Tech hosted 6,726 international students from 74 countries, including nearly 1,200 students from India. Indian students actually form our second largest cohort after our Chinese students. We also hosted 56 students from Canada. So I'm really excited to see that so many experts have accepted to join the conversation today and engage into some uh, thought-provoking uh, discussions. Thank you to all of the participants for your interests. Interest, so merci, shukriya, thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Kippen. And uh, I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate you for assuming your new role. And this is the first time you are participating in our program and hopefully uh, we uh, get your continued support for our future events. My pleasure. Thank you for your time. Uh, now it's my honor to uh, welcome Ms. Mary Waters, who's Deputy Commissioner for International Trade for Georgia Department of Economic Development. GDC, uh, GDECD has been our partners uh, for a very long time and supporter, sponsoring partner. And we really appreciate the department for all the guidance and support and to make this program possible. Uh, Mary. Great. Thank you, Ani, and good morning, everyone. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here and on behalf of Commissioner Pat Wilson uh, and the entire Department of Economic Development. Um, good morning and, and really looking forward um, to this 27th um, U.S.-India uh, Business Summit and very excited for the launch of this first annual Global USA Business Forum. I think that's a, a very appropriate uh, development given the trajectory of this conference through the years. Um, as Ani mentioned, the Department of Economic Development has been a proud sponsor of this event um, since 2010. Uh, time goes quickly, but um, we continue to support this event as a way to share diverse insights about pressing global business issues. Um, and the conversations and the insights um, that are shared to stay on top of global business trends um, and explore new opportunities, not just in India, but around the world. And that really uh, goes to the, the core mission of the department. Um, for those of you who might not be uh, as familiar with our role, um, our agency is tasked with um, attracting new jobs and investment uh, in Georgia and across all industry sectors and across all regions of our state. Um, and international engagement is really a key component um, of our job creation mission. And when you look at the statistics, certainly um, increased um, foreign direct, direct investment um, new international companies that are, um, are establishing operations in Georgia is, is really uh, a fundamental part of, of our deliverables uh, as a state agency. Um, but, but through our international partnerships, we're always seeking to enhance the international profile of our state, promote increased foreign direct investment, spur an increase in Georgia exports to the world, uh, and really create an environment where we can foster uh, innovation and collaboration that helps our businesses succeed. That's our ultimate goal. Um, India continues to be a very important economic partner for Georgia. Uh, I definitely uh, want to highlight this. And last year, bilateral trade exceeded $3 billion between Georgia and India. And I, I think when you stop and, and take a moment uh, to recognize what was happening in the global economy, that's really a remarkable figure. Um, that there's $3 billion in, in goods um, between, our, between our respective regions um, in a very challenging global landscape. I think that's incredibly impressive. 
Um, also, India was the 13th largest customer worldwide of Georgia-made uh, and Georgia-grown products um, in 2020. Uh, I'm always happy to, to see that. But I think for me, from my vantage point as a deputy commissioner for trade, certainly that door is always open to, to do more um, and what new linkages can we create to, to continue to build on that, uh, that trade relationship and our economic um, partnerships um, and getting more Georgia companies um, to uh, invest in India and, and getting more Indian companies to come and establish themselves here, here in Georgia. Um, but it isn't all about economic ties, certainly. We also share very strong governmental, educational, and cultural ties um, that really bolster uh, our economic partnerships. Um, I'm, we're very proud that um, there are thousands of Indian students studying at Georgia public universities, um, including the, the more than 1,200 students studying at Georgia Tech. Um, and so these students really become a, a critical component of not just the global workforce and the Georgia workforce, but um, really spurring additional um, additional connections. And when Indian students that study at junior, uh, Georgia universities, when, when they travel around the world or potentially when they return home, they become fantastic ambassadors for everything that's happening um, here in the state. Um, and so not only are our educational uh, institutions really supporting and, and training a truly globalized workforce that, that can, can succeed uh, in important industries of the future, but they're also continuing to share the message and essentially be ambassadors for us in what we're trying to do to continually grow international partnerships. Um, there is so much that we can continue to do. Certainly we're, we're proud of the, of the partnerships that we've built um, to this point, but there is always more work to do to create meaningful economic opportunities for Georgians. Um, and that's why we're a, a proud sponsor of, of this summit um, to continue to, to create new conversations uh, that lead to those partnerships for the future. Um, certainly, I would say that the current environment uh, requires us to ask key questions about how international business will be conducted. Uh, what is the future of global supply chains? Uh, what is the future of workforce? Where are we in terms of inclusive innovation? How do you uh, match up diversity and inclusion uh, in, a, in a globalized business environment? These are incredibly important topics, and I look forward to hearing from our speakers over the next two days about these critical issues that, that impact business around the world um, and for businesses um, to, to be part of the solution to some of these pressing challenges. I would just close by saying that global connections are more important now than ever. Um, and companies that are able to understand and adapt to new opportunities in global markets are, are simply positioned for, for stronger growth. Um, so global engagement, global business development, and understanding the trends and opportunities that shape uh, international markets help our companies sustain themselves uh, and grow for the future. Um, and so I look forward to the content of the next, uh, of the next two days, uh, and we're very pleased to continue to be part of the U.S. and the Business Summit. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Really appreciate your comments and partnership. And uh, I'm sure uh, we are giving you 16 sessions today, actually 15 after this. So please uh, do plan to join as much as you can. With this, uh, I would like to invite uh, my colleague from DEC and also Director of International Trade Administration, ITA of US Foreign Commercial Service, Mr. George Tracy. George. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks so much for having us. It's been our honor to be involved with the U.S. India Business Summit for all these years. Hard to believe we've been doing it for so long. It's always an outstanding program, incredibly good information, just very, very thought-provoking and interesting. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with my organization, uh, I work for the U.S. Commercial Service, which is actually part of the International Trade Administration, and we roll up into the Department of Commerce. We're a federal organization and um, aligned with um, Mary's team. Our, our mission from the highest level is to create U.S. jobs. The way we do that is by helping U.S. companies export. We typically target small, mid-sized companies, but we end up working with bigger companies quite often as well. Um, we have offices, at least one office in every state in the U.S., but probably equally or more important, we have commercial officers who work in the embassies and the consulates worldwide whose sole job is to help U.S companies either penetrate those markets or expand into those markets. We have a whole you know, menu of services and whatnot available to US companies. Um, 
most of the counseling and whatnot that we do is free. So any of you that haven't actually connected with us in the past, uh, you should reach out and do so. I say free, it's your tax dollars at work. So take advantage of that. Um, and, and we, particularly here in Georgia, we work very, very closely in alignment with the various partners in the marketplace. So uh, uh, state of Georgia has really an outstanding group of trade specialists who work with my team of trade specialists just in concert on all of our different projects with our companies. So reach out to us, we'll connect you with all the resources to help you expand. Um, that said, you know, it's interesting what we've been seeing as a trend. Um, let's just say 2019, 2020 were kind of a wash because obviously trade went down <laughs> for hopefully what are obvious reasons. But if you look back to 2018, trade um, between Asia and the United States was, was roughly around, exports in particular, roughly around 42 billion. Right now um, in 2021, as of the end of September, we're already right around 43 billion and overall trade is also up. So this year is panning out in terms of trade with Asia to be a record year between, for trade between US and Asia in general. Um, and I think it's interesting to point out that trade with China specifically is actually state, it's actually trended down over that same time period, pretty close to stagnant. But, but I, I mentioned that because the numbers are so big with China, the fact that China really hasn't grown all that much from a trade perspective, um, I think is a further indication of the opportunities that are opening up in Asia because it's being offset because Asia in general, much higher trade, even though China hasn't really increased that much. And with India in particular, that's a, a particular success story. I mean, in 2018, the trade with India was roughly 2.5 billion um, in exports particularly, but in 2021 already it's at 3.4 billion. So it's a huge uptrend. Um, so the opportunities are there. We, we see this in our client base. There's, there's a lot of interest in Asia in general and India in particular. Um, as far as like the top, the top 10 trading partners, uh, six of them in 2021 are Asian countries. And if you go back to 2018, only four were Asian countries. So all of this is just an indicator that um, hopefully we're coming out of this COVID nightmare, but also that trade between the US and Asia in particular, India is really on the upswing. And we see a lot of opportunity there. We're in obviously close contact with our people in India. We have multiple offices in India. A um, lot of opportunity both ways, exports and imports. The other thing I was gonna mention, particularly interesting related to this program is there's been a dramatic increase in interest around blockchain specifically associated with international trade. The number of countries have already implemented blockchain technologies uh, intended to facilitate international trade. And the World Trade Organization is, is looking into trying to create some standards around that. So blockchain, blockchain is gonna end up transforming probably just about everything we do in life, kind of like the internet did. But specific to international trade, it certainly has the potential to dramatically increase the efficiencies, um, reduce costs associated with international trade in all sorts of ways. And then you add in the cryptocurrency. And interestingly enough, we've had a couple of clients who have approached us about being paid in cryptocurrency because their foreign buyer was having a hard time getting hold of, um, of some other fiat currency. That's starting to come up and these are small companies. So this is gonna really, the digital economy is just gonna transform everything as it has over the past 20 years. And I think that's only going to continue to accelerate. So I am really looking forward to hearing the speakers um, over the next couple of days. It's going to be very, very interesting to me. I'm sure it's going to be fascinating for all of you. Thank you again for having us. Um, we look forward to continuing to participate in this event for years to come. Thank you, George. Uh, we have a question right now. Uh, let me read it out uh, to everybody. Uh, one second, please. Uh, the question is uh, for Mr. George Tracy from uh, uh, Tasneem Rahman. Uh, how is the current global supply chain issue affecting trade domestically and internationally? What are some solutions? An excellent question. And I think we can ask all of you. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's... That's uh, <laughs> boy, if I had the answer to that question, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, interestingly enough, I think in the U.S., 
at least from what I'm reading and hearing, um, in a lot of ways, it boils down to, this is going to sound kind of flippant, but hiring more people. Um, there's a shortage in, in, in all of the different steps within the supply chain. There is a shortage of expertise. Um, the reason they're not offloading the ships as quickly as they used to is because they don't have enough people to run the cranes that actually offload the ships. The reason that stuff's not getting out of the port is because they just don't have enough trucks to move the stuff out of the port. So there, there's, I think there's, a, there's an em employee issue all throughout this, this um, supply chain problem that we're facing, um, which I guess, you know, obviously the administration is working hard to try to resolve that. Um, we'll see what, what comes down the pipe, but I'd be interested to hear what some of the others have to say about that as well. I wanted to follow up on George's answer and ask Mary, Mary a follow-up question. The infrastructure bill uh, is supposed to provide relief, particularly to the port of Savannah. Can you tell us a little more? I know it's a very fresh news, very recent, and I was watching Senate hearings yesterday and uh, one of our federal senators so indicated during the hearings. Yeah, great question. And I would just sort of uh, reiterate what, what George was saying. Um, you know, there are multiple multiple issues um, happening with, with the supply chain shortage. And, and honestly, it comes down to, you know, lack of chassis as well. Um, lack of truck drivers, just uh, inventory um, stacking up. Um, to capacity and past capacity um, at ports um, across the nation and around the world, and that's creating this backlog. And there's only uh, so much we can do on a on a tight time frame to to open that back up. But um, I would say the port of Savannah certainly has tried its best, and I think demonstrated through through leadership and investment over the years that it's always. It's always looking forward to how to, to consistently increase capacity, and so um, you know, just just recently there was an announcement that there's that there's going to be um, new space opening up at our intermodal uh, port facilities across the state, um, expansion um, on premises at the port of Savannah um, to um, to allow more space for containers to be offloaded um, and wait for for customers to come and pick up their cargo that should help alleviate some backlogs. Um, and that's coming together with a, a long-term plan to um, continue to build out the facilities um, in Savannah and Brunswick to allow for um, more berths, um, longer, wider berths for post-Panamax ships so that the Port of Savannah specifically will continue to have um, capacity for millions of TEUs um, uh, above and beyond um, and the capacity that it currently has. So um, I, I guess I'm answering this, this question by saying the Port of Savannah, I, I believe through, through leadership has been forward thinking in this regard. Um, we're in a very tight, very uh, acute moment um, and the port is working um, with its ILA partners, um, with uh, partners across the state to, um, to create short-term solutions for, for the moment that we find ourselves in to alleviate uh, bottlenecks. Um, and just from an export perspective, I would say that the port is, is also a great partner in trying to get additional exports out from the port of Savannah and address that challenge of containers coming in and sitting and, and potentially having to go back out to sea empty. That's something that, that we're working on and creating that balanced trade. Um, so I can't speak specifically to the additional funding that the Port of Savannah will receive from the infrastructure bill. Um, I would simply say that that will go into existing um, state level investment um, to keep the Port of Savannah growing um, and staying ahead of anticipated global capacity um, that will come between now and, and 2030. Thank you very much. I had a follow-up question for George on cryptocurrency as a uh, store of value and a means of payment for international transaction. What, what's your forecast in terms of the short-term and medium-term horizon? It's happening now in terms of people using cryptocurrency to pay for various things, including international business. There's been a number of... Um, uh, well, quite a few uh, real estate transactions in foreign countries, uh, both directions, both 
uh, foreign nationals buying real estate in the United States and vice versa using Bitcoin specifically for those transactions. So I think the, you know, El Salvador has kind of stand, not standardized, but Bitcoin is now a, a, a reserve currency in that country. Um, if you start, and I believe we will start seeing more countries adopt that, it, it's a um, short term. I've got, if you're talking sort of the next couple of years, I think we're going to start to see an acceleration of acceptance of this, even, even with countries that are pushing back like China, um, it's out there. And in a lot of ways to me, from what I'm seeing, I am a certified blockchain architect, so I know quite a bit about this. Um, it's kind of screaming at the ocean at this point. It's, it's out there, it's being used to transact. Governments can try to get in the middle of it. They can try to stop it, but it's not gonna stop. And you've got different, you know, cryptocurrencies come in a lot of different flavors. Block, uh, Bitcoin is just a store of value. So it's, it's a currency. But then you have things like Ethereum, Ether, which is actually, it's also a store of value, but it's actually um, used to enable the blockchain to function. So all of these applications, these decentralized applications as they call them and smart contracts that are built on the blockchain on a platform like Ethereum need Ether, the cryptocurrency for Ethereum to actually function and operate. So as more of these blockchain apps come online, you're going to see an increase in demand for these various cryptocurrencies. And there's a lot of these different platforms that are optimized for different purposes. A lot of times people ask me, well, is Ethereum going to be the one that wins or will it be Solana or will it be Cardano and all that? That's kind of like saying, well, will C++ win or will it be Java or will it be Python? Or, you know, they, they're all kind of optimized for, for different purposes. And I think that there's, these things are going to persist. I think that's kind of a long-winded answer saying long term, I mean, it's here to stay. There's just so many benefits to leveraging the blockchain that there's just, it, it, it's inconceivable to think of it as actually going away. Um, for things like Bitcoin, where it really is a competitor for fiat currencies, the governments I assume are going to continue to try to tinker with it and, and in some way suppress it. It's gonna be really hard for them to regulate it because nobody controls it. Um, but, but in the end, I mean, if people accept it as, as a store of value and they accept it for, for transactions, goods and services, barring some law, making it illegal to do so, it's going to continue to grow. So you would say it's one of the major digitized economy international trade challenge in your Yeah, and it, I mean, it solves a lot of challenges. There's an awful lot of countries in the world that can't just go to the bank and get a million US dollars or euros or whatever it is that they need to buy something. But anybody can go online and pick up some cryptocurrency. I'm oversimplifying it, of course, but you can. And if I'm gonna, willing to sell my machine here in the US for 100 Bitcoin and a buyer in a country like just picking some country out of the air, you know, Nigeria, for example, where it's a little hard to get hold of fiat currency, um, that makes it a lot easier for people to buy my stuff if I'm willing to accept it. So yeah, it's gonna facilitate a, a lot of international trade, I believe. So it's a replacement for barter trade? Yeah, in some ways. I mean, you, they, you still have to get hold of the Bitcoin, but you can get buy Bitcoin with any fiat currency versus having to pay, you know, a lot of US companies, for example, really want US dollars. Um, if, if they were suddenly able to accept a cryptocurrency, or willing to accept a cryptocurrency, which which a lot are asking us about, uh, that opens up things for so many people. Uh, Annie, I had a question for, for Mary. Uh, yeah, in the sure. sense that Georgia is well represented overseas, I believe, correct me, there are about 11 or 12 offices to represent the state of Georgia uh, uh, overseas, uh, and uh, particularly in Asia. Can you tell us a little more about it? Because for us, India, is an exemplar of the potential growth for Georgia's economy in terms of those markets. But what are some of the other Asian locations in the, uh, represent in the representative offices uh, of the state of Georgia overseas? Wonderful, thank you, John, for that question. So the state of Georgia does maintain represent representation in 12 markets across the world. Um, and in Asia, we're in Japan, Korea, and China. Um, and I, I just take a moment to say that these are, um, these are representative uh, offices that were established many, many years ago. Japan is, is a wonderful example 
Um, it was the first international office that, um, that the state of Georgia did open uh, in 1973. So we are coming up on nearly 50 years uh, in the market. Um, our, uh, our current office in Europe was also established in 1973. So we're talking about very long-term investment uh, by the state of Georgia in, in some of these international partnerships. Um, and interestingly, a lot of these, um, a lot of these offices really started out as trade offices, right? Um, this certainly, it, you know, even in the 70s, attracting new uh, international investment to the state, it was, it was on our radar, but the most immediate opportunity was, was really trade development. Um, and so uh, many of these locations sort of start as trade offices and then um, kind of develop and grow to encompass all of the work that we're doing uh, across the Department of Economic Development. So not just export promotion, not just investment attraction, but tourism development, um, innovation uh, partnerships and collaboration. Um, you know, are there, um, are there synergies in terms of film and digital entertainment that can be, that can be supported by a, a our footprint of, of international offices. And so really um, over time and, and looking ahead, you know, where are those opportunities where we have a strong pipeline um, uh, of exporters, a strong pipeline for trade development, um, a strong um, pipeline for investment attraction, um, and that really under, underpinned by, um, by the work of the, the multiple divisions um, of our department. Um, that having been said, we are a very uh, deliberative <laughs> agency when it comes to investing new resources in, um, in international representation. Um, and I know I've, I've had uh, many conversations um, with folks about why we don't have, um, have a footprint in, in more locations. And I would just say that because these are very long-term partnerships, we are not interested in opening an office and then having to close it for whatever reason uh, due to budget cuts or due to uh, an insufficient uh, pipeline of, of companies or, or something of that nature. Um, from that standpoint, we do tend to move, quote unquote, a little bit slower um, and very deliberative in terms of the locations where we do as a state invest and have a footprint. Uh, that having been said, from a trade and an FDI perspective, we work incredibly closely with the International Trade Administration and with the U.S. Um, Commercial Service. Um, in helping expand our reach um, and really leveraging those federal resources for our Georgia businesses um, that are that are looking to do businesses over business overseas um, and their select USA team of putting states like Georgia um, on the radar of Indian firms, for example, looking to expand into the United States. That's a very close partnership, and it allows us to do more even in locations where we don't yet have, have a physical footprint as the state of Georgia. We, we do have a question in the uh, question and answer box that I wanted to, uh, to throw out, although it's a tax related question and nobody here is a tax expert. Let's go ahead with it anyway, give, give it your best shot. Um, from uh, David, um, I'm sorry, I have no idea how to pronounce your last name, David, I apologize. Um, it's a, as we are witnessing and reviewing needs for a digitized economy, what kind of tax reform can we adopt to continue to provide government services? Oh, that is a George question. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely well, is. Um, <laughs> no, I think governments in general are always very slow to catch up. And I think right now they are all trying to figure out how to catch up with this specific to blockchain crypto type stuff. Um, and, and the digital economy as well. I mean, I think it, there's a lot of transactions going on via the internet that I don't think that it took a while for the government to figure out how to tax Amazon, for example, right? So I think that's what we're seeing. I, I don't think there's like an, a real answer to your question yet. Um, and I think that's a, it's a moving target. Um, it'll be very interesting to see. I know the infrastructure bill, I think, did include some tax provisions around um, taxing the cryptos a little differently than they have been. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure what language actually ultimately ended up in the bill and how specifically that's going to impact the crypto industry. I know they were, they were tankering with it because there was a lot of blowback. Um, related to the original language. So 
I know that's not a great answer, but I think unfortunately it's just, it, it's um, stay tuned. I wanted to, to pick up on Mary's answer in terms of uh, the state of Georgia's global footprint and turn to my colleague, Bernard. Georgia Tech has long been, uh, has long deployed its wings overseas. Uh, Bernard, perhaps you can say just a few short words about our physical campuses overseas. Thank you, John. Yeah, I'd be happy to, you know, give you a little bit of a overview of our global footprint or the global learning network that we are continuing to build. So our first uh, abroad campus is uh, nearly 30 years old. It's located in the eastern part of France, Georgia Tech Lorraine. It's been very successful. We have about 700 students on a, on a regular year per year that uh, spend at least a semester there. And then we are um, also um, developing and, and continuing to build a very ambitious campus in uh, Shenzhen in, uh, in, in China. And so we have about uh, 175 students there currently and uh, 36 uh, staff members. And so it's growing. And we have a few other uh, locations uh, throughout the world. But uh, part of my mission is to continue to build that uh, global learning network. It's very important to have physical spaces. But I, I hear of uh, several universities, Carnegie Mellon, but Georgia Tech is one of them as well. The concept of atrium, which is a worldwide distributed presence with reduced physical presence. Can you say a few words about that? I think that's part of the strategic plans of Georgia Tech. Absolutely. So, you know, we have these big hubs, these campuses, but as you can, as you can imagine, uh, building a campus uh, takes a lot of time, a lot of resources. And um, we have a lot of um, alums and our Georgia Tech community is deployed all over the world. We have about 200,000 Georgia Tech alums. And many of those uh, alums kind of look for a space as well as their companies. They are involved with a physical space where they can get together, which is um, not necessarily a full-blown campus. And so we are actually trying to to the, that concept, uh, the Georgia Atrium, with a, a small physical space, people can gather where people can see, where we offer some of these online master's programs, and uh, really a place where uh, students and alums can can gather with uh, local uh, companies. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Thank you, uh, John. We, we also have now uh, Mr. John Woodward from Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. He has uh, had a busy morning. John, can you hear us? Thank you, Ani and, and, and John. And again, I apologize uh, for, my, for my lack of video, but it's probably for the good of the world that you can't see me. Uh, but no, it's, uh, I'm, I'm John Woodward. I, I head up the international team at the Metro Atlanta Chamber, the global commerce team, which, uh, which works with inbound and outbound, uh, both FDI, foreign direct investment, and working with companies here in this region that are expanding overseas, as I'm sure Mary uh, spoke spoke to earlier, um, because we very much believe trade and investment is a two-way street. Uh, talking about the partnership with Georgia Tech, again, as Ani mentioned, it's been a busy morning. I happen to be at Georgia Tech campus right now. <laughs> um, That's probably why you can't be seen. <laughs> So, um, so I'm, I'm at the Synergy building right now at the Georgia Tech campus in the heart of Tech Square, uh, uh, which is a tremendous example of the influence and the significance of Georgia Tech uh, uh, on the tech community and economic development in general uh, here in Metro Atlanta. But our uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, as Ani mentioned, we partner uh, uh, with Ani and with others. We are actually one of the oldest Chambers of Commerce in the U.S., uh, uh, dating to 1859. So we're in, uh, I guess, our 163rd year. Uh, we uh, are the voice of the business community. Our board of directors are the C-suites of major companies uh, in Metro Atlanta and in Georgia. Um, but we work very closely uh, as a regular uh, basis, as Ani mentioned, with the government sectors, with the uh, other NGOs, uh, with the academic sector, certainly Georgia Tech, uh, because it's all a collaborative uh, collaborative effort. So we are pleased uh, very much, uh, Ani, thank you, and John uh, McIntyre for inviting me back. Uh, we are pleased to partner with this conference for, gosh, Ani, I'm not sure how many years now, uh, but the UIBS has done a tremendous, 
<laughs> uh, UIBS has done a tremendous job on this, and um, there's a stellar program coming up in the next day and two, and uh, uh, we're just pleased to be part of it and to welcome everybody. Uh, and again, my apologies for not um, being visible, but uh, I'm here in spirit. Thank you so much. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Uh, we see you or not, but we feel you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for your our partnership and support. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. McIntyre, with this, I would uh, turn you over to close this session in two, three minutes. Yes, I, I, I think uh, this morning inaugural session has outlined some topics that deserve coverage during the two-day event, but also further down the line. I note particularly the issue of Bitcoins and cryptocurrency as a means of uh, international trade uh, payment. And also uh, the, uh, the advent of uh, Asia, uh, non-China uh, Asia, as a major partner, a trade partner for the United States. Uh, with this, uh, I think we are going to end our inaugural session. I want to, to thank my colleague Bernard and welcome him as the new the Vice Provost for International Initiatives. He has, uh, his work is cut out uh, and I know he'll rise to the challenge. I want to thank George Tracy, who is always a source of inspiration uh, in uh, opening the, uh, the vista, the road ahead and indicating to us where we have lagged in terms of understanding of the future. And of course, uh, uh, I want to thank uh, Mary Waters, who has been a source of guidance and the support all these years, our neighbor across the street. Thank you, Mary. And of course, uh, John at the uh, chamber, so active, so, so dynamic in terms of representing Atlanta globally. Uh, thank you very much. I think, Annie, we can move on forward in the program. We have now reached the magic time, 9.15. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to all the speakers for welcome session. We really appreciate your partnership and support and please do log out now and join back as using the audience link. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. I want to say just a few words about this uh, 27th Georgia Tech Global Business Forum, 12th U.S. India Business Summit and first Global USA Business Forum, which are combined because this is a major two day program. We're covering a lot of the new trends which create opportunities in an increasingly globalized digital economy. And some of the program components that we will be addressing are the role of digitalization in manufacturing. We will also look in some greater depth at the future of technologies, particularly at the regional and international level. We are going to have a keynote address by the vice chair of the, um, uh, the National Board of the National Science Foundation on Vision 2030, a vision for America's SNE enterprises. Uh, we'll then go on in some depth addressing issues of cybersecurity and privacy, which cut across uh, the digital economy in a very uh, telling fashion. We'll go on and look at digital infrastructure security in some greater depth. We'll look at the process of innovation in the state of Georgia. Uh, looking at some particular examples coming out of the, uh, the Curiosity Lab in Peachtree Corners and uh, the re recent advent of French Tech Atlanta, which is part of a network of over 100 such chapters throughout the world. We will then move on to, to address the issue of inclusiveness and innovation, always a challenging and important issue. And then uh, we will proceed with a keynote presentation from our colleagues in the United Kingdom on uh, the uh, uh, on Atlanta, uh, the rise of Atlanta as a global innovation district and what essentially are the key components of global innovation districts. We will then move on to the very timely topic of COVID-19 and its impact on global supply chains. Uh, we heard a few words from our colleagues at the U.S. Department of Commerce this morning during the inaugural ses session on that. We will go on to look at the future of work, picking up on the uh, keynote presentation of this morning at, uh, uh, coming up, uh, and then uh, move on again with issues relating to the future of technologies, looking at AI, robotics, and wearable, and also what is often known as the factory of the future in Industry 4.0.
we will proceed with uh, greater depth uh, analyzing digital infrastructure and cybersecurity, and then look at cybersecurity as a component of e economic development, concluding on the question of global mobility of talent. This will conclude with session eight, and uh, this will be a full two days as we are, uh, as we usually do in these forums. And we really appreciate your support and participation and look forward to a very insightful set of sessions.